evening and welcome to a joint meeting of the North Hampton City Council and School Committee. Uh, I am Mayor David and Jane Harkowitz. I've called this special meeting in accordance with our North Hampton Charter, uh, Section 7-2, Annual Budget Policy. And I'll begin uh, by asking uh, the clerk uh, to call the roll call of both bodies. Mr. Dennis Bidwell? Here. Ms. Maureen Carney? Present. Mr. Bill White? Here. Ms. Elisa Klein? Here. Present. Mr. David Murphy? Here. Mr. Dean Murphy? Here. Mr. Ryan O'Donnell? Here. Mr. Louise Shaw? Here. Ms. Molly Brown? Here. Mr. Dr. Present. Laura Allen? Present. Ms. Anderson? Present. Mr. Juan Cochran? Here. Mr. John Meyer? Present. Mr. Howard Ford? Here. Mr. David Murphy? Present. Uh, Ms. Susan Hoff? Present. And Mr. Alexander Hoff? Present. Present. Okay, excellent. I also want to acknowledge um, that uh, Superintendent Provost is here, Dr. Provost is here, um, Candace Walzak, the business um, administrator for the Northampton Public Schools. I also want to acknowledge that Dr. Andy Lincolnhoker from Smith Vocational um, Agricultural High School is here, uh, Crystal Fairman, from, who's also the business manager, um, and then my colleagues on the Smith Vocational and Agricultural I'm going to do a Smith Vocational High School Board of Trustees. Um, it's a mouthful. Smith, <coughs> uh, uh, the chair, Michael Kale, um, uh, um, John Cotton, I'm sorry. <laughs> and um, Tom. Tom Fitzgerald, I'm sorry. Tom Fitzgerald, yes. Uh, so, and I just want to acknowledge they're, they're here as well. Um, and also Susan Wright, the city's finance director. So, um, we're going to do. Um, uh, a, a presentation. Um, this is my attempt to try to go over kind of the financial trends, forecasts, and projections as we formally begin the FY 2019 budget process. Um, and uh, I have tried this year actually to um, compress the presentation. Um, it's about a third shorter than past years. Um, not because I'm trying to get home by 9 o'clock. Um, uh, for sure, and uh, but I, I wanted to really make sure we allowed time for questions and discussion, and um, and if there's questions along the way, you can just ask. So I'm going to ask Mr. Meyer if he'll just turn off the lights. Okay. Um, let's see. So the agenda for tonight is to go over sort of a few basic areas. First, we're going to do a quick overview of comparisons to neighboring or similar sized communities um, for selected financial indicators. Um, we're going to review our revenue and expenditure trends. Um, we're, going to rev uh, we're going to go over revenue and expenditure projections for fiscal year 2019. Um, we're going to review the five-year fiscal stability plan for the general fund. Um, it's been uh, a key part of our every budget uh, for the last five years. Um, we're going to then take a look at the fiscal year budget calendar, where we go from here, and then we're going to have questions um, and comments, time for questions and comments. So um, how does Northampton compare to neighboring communities on key financial indicators? These are the key communities that we use every year. They're all uh, Western Mass uh, based communities. Um, we select them because they have similar size, either populations, budgets, um, or their, their uh, neighboring communities. Um, we don't include Springfield because Springfield is so much larger than us. Um, these are the ones that we've used, um, and they seem to, to be you know, good, good comparison communities. So um, comparisons with neighboring communities. This is the average single family um, home value uh, for FY 2018. Um, you'll see that in blue uh, is Northampton. Uh, the state average for single family home value is $418,677. Northampton is 306908. Um, on the high end, Amherst at 352,979, down to Chicopee at 174,331. So that shows where we fit there. Um, the next slide is the average single family tax bill. Uh, the state average is $5,858. You can see Northampton again um, in blue, uh, $5,230. And again, the range goes from uh, Long Meadow, which is $8,481, uh, down to Chicopee, which is $3,192. Again, that's the single family uh, residential tax rate. Amherst is at 7462. I should also note that you know Amherst and Long Meadow. 
um, their rate is in the top 10 in the state in terms of uh, how it ranks when the Boston Business Journal does their, does their rankings. Residential tax rates, again, this is just looking at, um, this is looking at the residential tax rate itself. This is the number that we use per, <coughs> per $1,000 worth of value. Um, the, um, the tax rate for Northampton is $17.04. That's in blue. Um, you can see below us is uh, Agawam and East Hampton, which are right around $16 per thousand. And again, it goes all the way up to Longmeadow, uh, which is at $24.34 uh, per thousand. So that shows where we fit in that uh, range. Commercial tax rates, again, uh, we, uh, we have a, a single rate, $17.04. You can see that uh, $17.04 is you know, almost the lowest next to East Hampton at $16, um, all the way up to, uh, to Chicopee, Westfield, Holyoke. They all have split rates, so they have a much higher rate uh, for their commercial side. Um, they have a much uh, larger commercial uh, percentage of their properties in commercial uh, uh, real estate. Holyoke, I just have to asterisk, that is their last year's FY2017 um, uh, rate because their rate has not yet been set for 2017, but they were at 39.72. Um, and then again, Westfield behind them at 36.82. This is the unemployment rate um, in the valley, uh, going from left to right, starting with Amherst to Longmeadow to Northampton at 2.6, um, up to uh, you know Agawam, Westfield, West Springfield, Chicopee, and then Holyoke at 4.9 percent. This is from the Executive Office of Labor and Workforce Development as of uh, uh, November of 2017, the latest statistics they have available. This is new growth. Um, new growth is, is basically expansion of either the residential or commercial tax base in a given year. Um, you can see that Northampton um, is sort of in the sort of upper middle, uh, $963,629 in new growth. Um, West Springfield, $1.4 million, and Longmeadow down at the lower end, $229. Million. New growth is important because when we go um, to figure out our tax uh, levy and we look at how much revenue we're going to raise, um, you are allowed to, 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 to raise revenue uh, above 2.5% um, to, uh, for the new growth. You're allowed to count the new growth toward your, toward your new revenue. So that does generate new revenue and is not capped by the 2.5%. Um, looking at reserves, uh, reserves are basically the general fund and enterprise reserves. These are the reserve uh, positions of all these same communities. Um, and this is again, uh, you know, as a percentage of their budgets for FY 2017. Um, Agawam is up at 27.22%. Um, Northampton's at 17.99%, all the way down to, you know, Holyoke, East Hampton, Longmeadow at 5.72%. So that just shows what the reserve positions are of all these different communities. Um, this one is, uh, it's got a lot of colors going on, but, it's, but I want to just explain um, why I think it's an important one for us to look at. This is percentage of general fund revenue by source. And I'll just quickly um, go through the colors. Northampton is, uh, it's, it's not highlighted, but it's basically one, two, three, fourth from the right. Um, and what's important is to look at, first of all, the, um, the blue is, is taxes, tax levy. Um, it's what's being generated from uh, property taxes. The yellow is, coming, is state aid. So the yellow is state aid. Um, the orange is other local receipts, so that would be things like hotel, motel, um, it would be meals tax, it would be parking revenues, other local sources beyond just meals tax. And then the other uh, really smaller set is just additional revenues that, that come uh, uh, to the city. Um, you know, in our case, it might be things like uh, the monies we get for the veterans district or things like that. Um, but what's really interesting here is that you look at Northampton, 48.26% uh, of our general fund revenue is from uh, property taxes. 32.65% uh, is from those other sources. Our aid, other than Longmeadow, is one of the lowest. 13.7% of our general fund revenue is, is from state aid. Um, so really, 
other than other than Longmeadow, we're receiving uh, the lowest amount of state aid, um, and we're also relying on a, a more diverse uh, set of local revenues. Contrast that with Holyoke, um, which is to the far right of the screen, 33% uh, or almost 34% of their ge general revenue is coming from tax levy. 54% um, is coming from state aid, um, and then 11.03 uh, from other sources. Obviously. Uh, Holyoke has a, a different, um, a different socioeconomics, uh, different uh, 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 income rates, different property values, um, and other challenges that that make them qualify for additional aid. But it shows you, um, in terms of what our what our revenue, where our revenue comes from, as a percentage. Financial flexibility. Um, this again gets back to our reserves, um, and we basically have four types of reserves. We have the undesignated fund balance, which we also call free cash, and that's what we'll refer to it um, in the rest of the uh, presentation. We have our regular stabilization fund. Um, we have our capital stabilization fund. And then we have the fiscal stability stabilization <coughs> fund that was specifically set up as part of our multi-year uh, fiscal stability plan. Um, so when we look at our free cash history or the undesignated fund balance, um, this shows you kind of a 10-year snapshot of that. Um, so basically what, what the undesignated fund balance or free cash balance is, is it's the funds, it's, it's the funds that are left over at the end of a given uh, fiscal year, um, and it's comprised of either revenues that came in um, higher than budgeted or expenditures that came in lower than budgeted. Um, and the Department of Revenue certifies that each year. Um, the, um, the, the DOR recommends that cities and towns should, should be shooting for between 3 and 5% of their general fund budget as free cash. Um, you can see that uh, we've had mostly positive years. You'll see in FY 2010, uh, which was during the 2009 financial crash, we actually had a negative uh, free cash balance, as did most communities around of the Commonwealth because state aid was cut sharply uh, that year in the middle of the fiscal year. Um, we've worked hard uh, to, to uh, build up our free cash um, each year, um, and, and you'll see why as we go further um, why we've done that and, and how we're using the free cash. This shows you how we use free cash, good segue. Um, and uh, there's a lot of different colors going on. I'll just sort of highlight the main ones. Um, the, the blue, the dark blue at the bottom is capital. So when we, um, when we build our capital program, a big portion of what we, what we allocate to that is free cash. And that's everything for you know, city and schools. Um, and, and so you can see that we've really strategically tried to use a lot of free cash <clears throat> to be able to do more paving, more vehicles, more school projects um, as part of our capital plans. The three green colors are our stabilization funds, uh, uh, regular stabilization, capital stabilization, and the fiscal stability fund. Um, and counselors will know that usually when free cash gets certifi cer certified, um, I often come to them either at the <clears throat> after the certification. <clears throat> Sorry, I need some water. <laughs> <clears throat> after the certification or at the end of the fiscal year, and we transfer money into those stabilization accounts. Um, the, the other one that I would point out is red. Red means that we're using free cash for operating expenses. Um, we try to avoid that. Um, it, it happens. Um, generally, if you look to the right of the, of the graph where we've used it more recently, the principal area that we do it is for um, snow and ice. Every year we, we budget for a certain amount of snow and ice, but then obviously if we have a really bad winter, we have to go back and backfill it with, um, with monies and we use that from the, um, from the uh, free cash account. But we also have sometimes unforeseen um, small capital expenses, sometimes some unforeseen um, personnel ex uh, expenses that we have to, uh, have to use, but generally we don't want to build a budget using one-time monies. Now, if you look to the left of the screen, um, you'll see that that you know it was a we were using our rainy day fund and it was it was pouring. Uh, we were basically relying on every last bit of our reserves, every last bit of our free cash to prop up our budgets. Um, again, right around the time of the financial crash, when we lost um, when we lost 
you know, two million dollars of state aid in the middle of the budget year, um, and the economy tanked, and and new growth was at its lowest level. And you can see as we came out of it in 2011, uh, we we um, we had to use pretty much a, a ton of free cash. We didn't actually have a capital program that year um, because we didn't we couldn't afford to spend free cash on anything else. Um, <coughs> so we've worked really hard to make sure that we have a you know free cash levels that are within the recommended. Um, levels and we've used those to fund capital as well as to rebuild our reserves from that time period FY uh, 2008 to 2011 because again part of the reasons we have reserves is because it may start raining again we may have a we may have another fiscal crisis and those will help us continue uh, to keep services running if we have to dip into them this is our history of the other general fund reserves, the green ones. This is general fund stabilization, capital stabilization, fiscal st uh, stability stabilization. Um, you know, it's, we've, we, uh, we started the fiscal stability stabilization. It's starting in FY14, so that really only shows up in FY14. Uh, but you can see that we've built these funds up um, over the last several years um, in order to uh, to, to meet our potential future needs. Capital stabilization, we actually, it's reached a level where we're actually beginning to use some of it towards our capital um, improvement uh, spending. Um, we have a whole fiscal policy about how we'll use capital uh, stabilization when it reaches a certain level. Um, but reserves and, and our reserve uh, fund balances are also critical when we're looked at by outside rating agencies. When they take a look at what is our, what is our financial stability, what is our financial flexibility, um, and that kind of leads to the next uh, slide, which is our bond rating. Um, and you can see, um, you can see starting in 2011, uh, we started with an A plus negative rating from Standard & Poor's, and then slowly as we've been able to, uh, to, to build up our reserves, uh, to put in place other fiscal policies, it includes the years uh, that we even had to ask for an override. Um, we've slowly built that up uh, from, two, in 2014 we were upgraded to a triple A, or a double A plus, and then in 16 and 17 we were upgraded to a triple A rating. We again put it to the comparison communities on the right, uh, which shows you our comparison communities. We're the only one among those um, comparison communities to have uh, that triple A uh, bond rating. Um, why is that important? Well, uh, primarily it's important when we go out to bond for large capital projects, um, which we do as, as a part of our capital improvement spending. Um, and when we've, we asked our, our bond uh, folks to, to give us sort of some comparisons with other, um, you know, with other communities, so we, we recently in May of 2017 um, issued a bond uh, for $3.3 million. Um, we uh, received an interest rate of 1.5% on that over the life of that uh, bond. Um, comparing it to some other communities with, with lower bond ratings, um, you know, town of Lancaster, 2%, two, 2% two um, all the way up to Pittsfield, uh, which has an AA negative, 3.25%, uh, um, but ours was the lowest of that category in terms of the, uh, in terms of the interest rate. So it gives us borrowing, uh, more borrowing power, and of course, the, 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 um, the debt service comes out of our general fund budget. So uh, we're able to actually borrow more, <coughs> do more projects with lower uh, debt service costs. So that's why it's, that's one of the reasons why it's important. Um, this is just a quick overview of the latest uh, Standard & Poor's Global Ratings. Um, very, they, they've highlighted some of the pieces about Northampton, very strong economy, very strong management, strong budgetary performance, uh, very strong budgetary uh, flexibility, um, and I'll also note on that one, uh, with available fund, uh, strong available fund balances and an ability and willingness to raise taxes when needed, um, very strong liquidity, uh, very strong debt and contingent liability uh, position, strong institutional framework score, uh, strong management team with strong performance and strong reserves. The last sentence, of course, says that uh, you know, if pension and OPEB costs continue to rise, pressuring budgetary performance and leading to reduced reserves, we could lower the rating. Um, those of you may have, have uh, followed the fact that the state recently had its bond rating downgraded uh, for the first time in, I don't know, 20 or 30 years, and essentially the rating agents said that they were, again, um, 
uh, beginning to tap too much into their reserves and relying too much on reserves uh, to prop up the budget, which is one of the reasons why it was downgraded. So that's the, uh, that's the reserve picture. Now turning to general fund budget issues for FY 2019. What revenue trends are important in 2019? How much new revenue can we build into the budget? What expenditures are projected to grow in FY 2019? And what is the long-term budget outlook uh, for the general fund? So this is just a quick source, uh, quick pie chart that shows you the revenue sources that we use to build the FY 2018 budget. 66.42% um, of it is taxes, and again, that's property, excise, um, all, all forms of local taxes. 17.75 is the next biggest uh, piece of the pie, that's state revenue. And then you can see the various smaller, uh, smaller revenue sources, including you know, licenses and permits, uh, charges for services, um, et cetera. Charges for services, I believe, would include Smith Vogue tuition, for example. Um, this is the new estimated new property tax revenue uh, that we are anticipating for FY 2019. Um, this includes the new growth that I referred to um, and using the formula under Proposition 2.5 plus projected estimated new growth, we're anticipating uh, $1,948,035 in new property tax revenue for FY 2019. Um, you can kind of see the progression, uh, again, the 10-year progression that we show here. Um, the, the two years that, are, that have asterisks, asterisks on them are 2010 and 2014. Those were years where we had a general override. So if you notice a slight, slight higher increase there than normal, uh, that's because we were able to go above the 2.5% uh, with the permission of the taxpayers. Um, in terms of what the new growth estimate for 2019 is, uh, we're using an estimate of 750,000 in new growth. Again, new growth are basically all the new residential and commercial properties that come online that you can add to your tax base. I show this slide just to show you the cyclical nature of uh, new growth. It's very much tied to the economy and what's happening in the economy. We have been fortunate, uh, particularly, you know, FY15, FY16, a uh, little dip in 17, but again in FY18, uh, to have much, to have, to have really robust uh, new growth in the $900,000 range. That's one of the reasons we were able to extend the fiscal stability plan longer uh, because of that positive new growth. But again, you can see FY10 uh, when we, um, and FY11 during the, during the last, uh, major budget dip uh, that those numbers you know went down that's revenue basically that we are unable to make up through the uh, through the tax base so uh, so 750 is the estimate that we're using for this year and we're sort of um, you know making a multi-year average uh, to come up with that number Next is the estimated increase in other taxes for 2019. Uh, these are estimates we're using to, to see how much of an increase we would project for hotel motel, meals taxes, motor vehicle excise, and other uh, miscellaneous uh, taxes, boat excise, et cetera. And so we're estimating about 113,144 in those new um, um, uh, revenues. Uh, you can see on the left is just a quick synopsis of hotel, uh, motel, and meals, which again can be somewhat cyclical and tied to the economy. The low one on the right is actually FY18 to date. We're obviously not through the full fiscal year, uh, but we're just showing you where we are uh, to date. So I think we're on track uh, to have a similar levels. Uh, the motor vehicle excise trend, um, again, tied to car purchases, how many new cars and, and what, the, uh, what the years of those cars are uh, based on how much. FY18, you can see, is really low. That's because the excise tax bills go out in February. So that number is going to jump after February. Um, so those are just two of those many that are going to go up. We're estimating about 113,000. Estimated increases in local receipts. Um, these include ambulance receipts, uh, building wiring and plumbing permits, um, our medical marijuana host agreement will go up this year. That's a host agreement that we've had in place uh, since New England uh, Treatment Access opened their uh, medical dispensary on Con Street. Um, and then other miscellaneous items such as interest income, fines, et cetera. So 344,152 in estimated increases in local receipts. 
Um, this is the, uh, I hope you're all see seated, you are. This is the whopping increase we're in expecting in state aid uh, based on the governor's uh, budget. This is the governor's budget, House 2, that was recently released. Um, and this is, a, this is basically the cherry sheet um, that, that we get from the Department of Revenue uh, and that we'll continue to get updates to through the state budget process. Um, but in terms of what Northampton will see um, in, in state aid on the, on the uh, revenue side uh, is $66,081. Um, you'll see that you know, Chapter 70, uh, which is our, you know, one of our major 8 million plus accounts uh, that funds our schools, um, looking at a 0.68% increase in Chapter 70. Uh, Northampton's a minimum aid community. Uh, the governor has proposed a very minimum increase um, in that line item. Um, you'll see that uh, we have a, a, a slight increase in charter tuition reimbursement. Um, Obviously, uh, that's not a fully funded line item, so it's still well below what it should be. Um, unrestricted local government aid is going up 3.5%, uh, which is 153. But basically, when you add up all the pluses and the minuses, because again, there's, there's, both, um, there's both aid and then there's chargebacks, the net of it is uh, $66,081, which is a 0.43% increase in uh, net state aid, again, under the governor's FY 2019 budget. So when we take a look and we, and we add up all those major revenue sources that I just went through, um, property tax and new growth, motor vehicle, hotel, motel tax, local receipts, uh, the state cherry sheet numbers, um, the other, uh, other uh, revenues, including some uh, state ambulance reimbursements and some and interfund transfers. The total estimated new revenue in FY 2019 is $2,542,109, or about a 2.74% um, increase in new revenue. Uh, so that's the, sort of the revenue side of the budget. Now we have the revenue. Now let's take a look at what we think our costs will be, because that's obviously, you know, that, that's, that's the, the other key part of the equation, how much it will cost to operate um, our city uh, in FY 2019. So we'll start again by looking at what we're, what we're spending on in FY 2018. Um, you can see the various parts of the pie chart, um, including education, 39.23%. Um, employee benefits, 20.29%. Uh, uh, public safety, almost 15%. Uh, general government is at 5%. And, and on and on down the line, uh, the different, uh, the different uh, breakouts. Sorry, I just need some water. Um, uh, again, as I always do in this presentation, when we talk about education being 39.23%, <coughs> Uh, two three percent of the budget um, that's showing the direct appropriation to the schools um, total education spending when you look at the indirect um, expenditures for things like employee benefits insurance uh, debt on capital school projects um, the general government services uh, that we provide uh, the charter school tuition for outgoing students the school choice tuition for outgoing students uh, when you factor in all of those pieces that are related to education, um, education spending accounts for 56.5 percent um, of our uh, of our general fund budget in um, in in FY 2018. When we when we turn now to what are some of the largest line items that we'll need to make increases to in the general fund budget for FY 2019, just like we did with um, just like we did on the revenue side. Um, the largest uh, line item, as is often the case, is uh, Northampton Public Schools, um, which we're projecting for uh, FY 2019 a 3% um, increase, which is $865,169. Um, you can see kind of the, the chart that shows the 10-year uh, the, the, the snapshot of that. Um, and again, this tracks very closely to our multi-year uh, fiscal stability plan that we've worked on uh, to, to make sure that we can provide reasonable increases uh, but stay within the parameters of that multi-year plan. Um, when we look at the growth in the appropriation for NPS, I, I, um, I've, I've heard from people recently saying that we haven't 
um, increase the schools or we haven't increased it enough. I thought this is actually a, an interesting slide to keep in mind. Um, this shows you the increases, uh, the increase in the appropriation for the Northampton Public Schools um, since FY 2014, which was the first year of the fiscal stability plan. That year we gave a 6.3% increase. As you may recall, we took a million dollars of the $2.5 million override and gave that to the schools um, to both backfill uh, cuts they were facing, but also to help them add back some programs that were lost. What I've put alongside that, though, because I think it's important, is our health insurance um, expenditures during the same time, which are not part of the appropriation to the schools, um, but the schools uh, represent about 50% of those health insurance costs. Um, so I wanted to show that alongside of the increases. Now, in FY 2014, one of the things we did at the same time we were proposing uh, the fiscal stability plan and the override, we also moved the city into the GIC as a way to save and to further cut the deficit that we were facing at the time, which was in excess, I think it was approaching 2.7 million. Um, we were able to move into the GIC um, and, and immediately see cost savings in 2014 and 2015. So um, in FY14, 6.3%, FY15, 3.4%, 3% in 2016. And then I think it's important to look at in FY 2017, we again maintain that 3% increase to NPS. At the same time, we were absorbing an 8.75% increase um, in health insurance, which is 10% of our budget. It's one of the largest line items. And again, in FY18, a 3% increase to NPS. At the same time, we were absorbing a 5.28% increase in health insurance. Uh, again, in 2019, a th we're estimating about a 3%, we're estimating a 3% increase. And as you'll see in a minute, um, we're looking again at another 5% possible increase in health insurance. So I just, it's important to talk about, I think, that when we're talking about the schools, it's a bigger picture than just the direct appropriation. And you'll see that what I've tried to do is hold the schools harmless against those fluctuations in health insurance. Um, so it's just, I'm trying to provide a bigger picture on that. Turning to health insurance, which again is one of, uh, another one of our uh, largest increases um, in the budget every year, it's sort of the second biggest one that we anticipate. Um, we are estimating, uh, again, about a 5%. That's what we're using um, um, as an anticipated increase, which would be $558,619. Um, the GIC uh, made an announcement earlier, earlier this year that they were looking at 5% as a target. Um, of course, they were also doing that in the context of some changes they were going to make to plans. Uh, they were planning to reduce. Uh, reduce the number of plans. They're actually meeting on Thursday uh, to reconsider that and probably to um, rescind that decision. Um, that was supposed to yield some measure of savings, $20 million to the GIC. We don't know what the impacts will be um, on you know, expanding the plans back out to the full number, whether or not it's going to affect that 5% number. So that's going to be a key number that we'll be watching over the next uh, several weeks. They'll set those rates in March um, after a series of public hearings, um, and that's going to be a major factor in terms of putting together the, um, the FY 2019 budget. Obviously, if it comes in higher, uh, that's problematic. If it comes in lower, it gives us more flexibility uh, to do other things. So uh, that's the second largest. Um, uh, this year, actually, uh, one that's going to turn out to be actually maybe the second largest, when I, now that I look at it in this order, is going to be debt service. Um, in FY 2019, our debt service is going to increase by 675, uh, 434. Again, this is part of the general fund debt expenditure to pay for all of the various borrowings we've done over time um, for both city and school projects. Um, the reason why there's this spike or slight spike or larger than normal um, spike um, for our debt service this year is related to the non-debt excluded portion of the police station. Um, as you may recall, uh, when the police station, uh, the new police station project uh, was being built, um, we, we were doing it in, the, in that same time period of you know, FY uh, 2010, 2011, 2012. Uh, which was also a very difficult budget um, period as well. 
we did part of it, a $10 million of it was as, as a debt exclusion. So that was paid for by a dedicated uh, revenue source um, uh, above and beyond the 2.5% limits of Proposition 2.5. But then there was an additional $7 million that was on the general fund side for both the design um, and the <coughs> remaining portion of, of the uh, police station costs. So we've, we had to work that into our debt service. When we did the borrowing for that, because of the, um, because of the financial issues at the time, we did sort of a hybrid uh, borrowing, a hybrid bond um, that allowed us to pay lower payments in the, in the early years um, so that we could build up more debt capacity to be able to handle them. So now we're basically turning the corner, um, the hybrid portion's ending, and so we're seeing an uptick in um, about $414,000 increase in that non-debt excluded police station debt. It's going to gradually start working its way back down, um, but it was a model unlike a traditional model where you pay one same payment every year for you know, 20 years uh, that we use to be able to work within the very tight uh, uh, fiscal constraints that we were facing at the time. So that's one of the reasons for that increase. Um, is that uh, is that change in the debt service on the police station project? This is the estimated increase in state charges for FY 2019. So these are charges uh, against the city. Um, you know the, the the cherry sheet, and we've actually done this in pink, so you so you uh, have that same feel of the cherry sheet for those of you old timers. Um, the um, the so. Half of the cherry sheet are revenues, uh, and then the other half are charges. Um, charges, of course, uh, can be things like you know RMV. It can be regional transit like PBTA. Um, it's also school choice sending tuition, and it's also charter school sending tuition. Um, so when you, when you go through all of those uh, all of those uh, factors and Charter school sending tuition, for example, is going up 16.85% this year. Um, so that's a 16.85% increase in our charter school funding tuition, ascending tuition. Um, there's other smaller um, increases. But the net effect of this is that our charges, uh, which the state will be, will be charging us, will be going up 9.07%, or $315,805. Uh, you can make that contrast with the 60,000 increase in, in, in revenues, new revenues we're going to see. So net state aid, when you take a look at net state aid, again, we're, we're using a wider, more than a 10-year window here because we want to sort of show how far we've actually come. You can see back in FY 2002, and these are all real dollars, we were receiving 13546 in net state aid. Uh, and you can see moving over to the right how far uh, down uh, state aid has gone and stayed. And actually, in FY 2019, based on the governor's budget, uh, we're estimating a reduction in state aid, obviously, over FY 2018, based on the, based on the charges and, uh, and new revenues that were projected. So that shows you, again, where we are um, on the net state aid picture. Again, I mentioned charter and school choice, um, outgoing charter tuition, which I referenced earlier, going up 16%, um, continues to increase. Um, it's not being fully funded. Um, the reimbursements are not being fully funded. Uh, the governor's budget uh, funded charter school reimbursement at 80.5 million, which is exactly what it was funded at last year, um, which was underfunded that year. Um, the MMA estimates that that's approximately 85 million below the amount needed to fully fund uh, the schedule that's that's based in the state law. Meanwhile, so while while you know they're falling behind further on reimbursements, uh, total tuition assessments in the state are growing by 66 million or 11 percent in fiscal uh, 2019 to more than 660 million. So again, as we continue to see this growth in charter school. Uh, that's coming from the same pie that we rely on for Chapter 70 and other education funding. Uh, so that continues to be a major issue facing not only the schools, but the city as a whole. The next, um, the next item uh, that where we'll see an increase in expenditures is retirement and OPEB, OPEB being other than post-employment, uh, ben other post-employment benefits. These are, these are the, the things that we have to uh, pay to our retirement system. 
um, to be able to make sure that those are on track and remain solvent. Uh, $224,515 um, is our estimate uh, for that. So if you go ahead and take a look at our preliminary estimate of increases and decreases in FY 2019, if you sort of add them up, um, and you know, we, didn't, we didn't go through all the departmental budgets, again, in the interest of time, uh, but we're estimating about a 2.75% increase in those departmental budgets, again, in line with our fiscal stability plan. When you add all those up, we're looking at about a three, well, not about, $3,376,344 uh, in preliminary estimates of increases and decreases in expenses uh, for FY 2019. So revenues, expenses, um, you know, that brings us to sort of the, the, the basic mathematical equation. Um, we're estimating 2.542 or 2.5 million. Um, the preliminary estimate of expenses is about 3.3 million. Um, so we're showing right now, again, as we stand here today, using the governor's budget, um, making some, some estimates that we can make now before other numbers come in, we're looking at about an $834,225 shortfall in terms of revenue versus expenditures. We still have a series of unknowns uh, that we have to work through uh, to really understand what that number truly is. Um, obviously, uh, we, we, don't have, we don't yet have a firm number for the Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School uh, budget. Um, they are still waiting to get their final um, uh, uh, out-of-district tuition number, which is a major part of their budget. So we'll be working with uh, Dr. Lincoln-Hoker and his team over the next several months as they get that number uh, to understand what, uh, what part of the budget that will represent. Um, health insurance, I mentioned before, is another big unknown. We're using 5%. Um, uh, we don't know if that's going to what that's going to be until we get those final rates and we're able to calculate. Um, and particularly, you may see an announcement that there's you know an increase, and often they'll say it's a three percent increase. Often they're doing a blended weighted rate when the MMA announces it. What's really important is what are the plans that our people are subscribed in? What are going to be um, those new costs? And we'll have a better understanding of what that what that line item needs to be. Um, again. We're developing our city side budgets. Uh, we're, we're assuming a 2.75% uh, increase for those non-school city departments. We have to work through each one of those departments, uh, meet with the leadership, figure out what needs there might be. But that's an assumption at this point until we go through that process. We're still, still waiting for our costs for workers' comp, property and liability, vehicle insurance, uh, those we don't yet have uh, firm estimates for. Um, Obviously, the House budget will be the next step in the process. The governor has put his budget forward. Now we'll wait to see what the House budget is. You saw those empty columns on the cherry sheet. When the House introduces their budget, those columns will be filled in. And then after that, the Senate budget. We usually only get the House budget uh, uh, before it's time that we have to submit the budget. Um, because by the time the Senate issues their budget, it's usually the exact same time uh, where we have to submit the uh, city budget. Um, feel fairly confident in if we know the governor and we know the House number, uh, that that's going to be a fairly good approximation. Uh, only the House can, uh, can call for new revenues. The Senate can't. Um, so they're much more limited in what they can do. So generally, the House budget works out to be fairly close to what the final budget will be. One other thing I put on here, it's, it's, a, it's a super unknown, um, but it may come into play in terms of a potential new revenue source. The timing probably won't work out for the budget, but retail marijuana uh, revenue. Um, obviously, we have a new um, industry that's been approved by the voters, and regulations are being developed. Um, I've actually introduced a order to city council for Thursday that will adopt the local option uh, sales tax on retail uh, marijuana sales of 3%. Um, and so there may be additional revenue coming from that industry to the city. Um, whether or not we'll know more about that, the licensure process doesn't begin until April. The first license can't be issued until July 1, the start of FY 2019. Um, I just put that on there as a question mark as a, and a placeholder for that could be an additional new revenue source 
uh, that we could factor in moving forward. But again, we don't know what it is. We don't know um, if and how many of these facilities there may be in Northampton. So those are the estimated uh, revenues and expenses. Again, looking at a shortfall today of about 834 uh, 225. So now we turn uh, finally to the fiscal stability plan, uh, which I know you've heard me talk about for the last five years, sort of like a broken record. Um, it's been part of every one of my budgets. It's been part of every one of my budget messages. Um, when, we, uh, when we presented this plan, that's actually a picture of me presenting the plan uh, to the city council um, with my dog-eared giant poster that I carried around town. Uh, at, at town hall meetings and schools and ev anywhere anyone wanted me to talk about it. Um, that was the very first fiscal stability plan that we put together. Um, again, this was in April of 2013. We asked the voters in June of uh, 2013 to approve a $2.5 million override, general operating override, and it was in conjunction with a plan uh, that we would use to stabilize uh, city and school finances over the next several years. <coughs> you can see this is the original plan that we presented at the time um, on the left. And basically, the plan was that we would not spend all of the new $2.5 million in additional revenue. We would obviously fill the gap that we were facing uh, in, in, in 20, FY 2014, which was about $1.7 million plus. Um, and then we would put the, the excess revenue into what we call the Fiscal Stability uh, Stabilization Fund, which you've seen earlier in the presentation. Um, in 2015, again, we would allow for uh, reasonable increases in our, in our budget areas with a goal to try to maintain level services. Um, and that giant chart, and, and that chart has appeared as part of every budget message updated every year, shows the projections that we've used to estimate how much growth we foresee in each uh, subsequent budget year. Um, so in FY 2014, FY 2015, FY 2016, um, we would be able to uh, support our budget and put some funding into this fiscal stability fund. Then in FY 2017, we would basically have to draw money from the fund. The blue is the drawdown. And then in FY 2018, uh, we would be uh, basically facing a major deficit again. That was the original plan um, as we envisioned it. Um, uh, the voters accepted it, and we were able to uh, put that plan into motion. As I said at the time, and as I've you know, said every year since, every year we reevaluate the plan, we look at factors like new growth, we look at the estimates that we made in one year, we are constantly updating the multi-year averages, uh, and, uh, and considering you know, what, uh, what the projections will be going forward. I mentioned earlier that new growth was very helpful. Um, because that created revenue that we weren't projecting in, uh, in June of 2013 when we were coming out of those low years of, of new growth. So that helped us actually be able to extend the plan um, in, in 20, FY 2015 and 2016 um, and actually ex extend it. You'll see, um, you'll see in the next slide or the slide after uh, we were able to extend it out to FY 2020. So this just shows you, this next slide just shows you the fiscal stability fund as it's been built up over those uh, four, uh, five years rather, you know, beginning in 2014 when we, again, of the $2.5 million, we put 773 plus of it into the fund. Uh, and then again, each year it built up more and more. The idea being, and I've, I've sort of compared it somewhat to a roller coaster, um, because basically the idea is we would build up um, uh, and then at a certain point we're going to kind of reach the top of the roller coaster um, and then we're going to have to start dipping into the fund in order to again maintain uh, the prog maintain the, the level service budgets that we want to have over the next several years. The left was the original plan. Um, the right was the plan that's been uh, more updated uh, over the last several years uh, to account for that new growth. Um, and you can see that we basically have been able to, um, you know, maintain regular increases um, in our budgets, avoid uh, the layoffs that we were facing on an annual basis prior to FY 2014. And we've been able to basically contribute to the fund um, pretty much up to 2017. Um, in FY 2018, we weren't able as part of the, as part of the budget to put funding into 
the uh, fiscal stability plan. And then you can see um, FY 2019, which is the current fiscal year, which we're now in the blue, you'll see the blue start to show up. And so to, you know, standing here today, when I look at the budget and I look at the 834, again, roughly, you know, rounding that up to about 850 just for purposes of this demonstration, we would project that we would have to use 850,000 of that fiscal stability fund in order to balance the FY19 budget. So again, this would be the first time we would draw from that fiscal stability fund. Um, then, of course, you know, just like all of these charts every year, uh, that we've, we, we've updated them in uh, 2020, we'd have to use uh, an even larger portion of that, uh, which would then, again, lower the amount that was left in the fund. Um, and then uh, as we moved into the FY 2021 budget, we'd be, you know, in the red significantly. Um, and again, as I've said throughout this process, um, we'd then be facing, uh, you know, what would be next? Would we go back to the voters and ask them to renew the plan, um, to give us an extension to the plan? Um, if that was not something that would be possible, then we would have to make cuts uh, to services, which is something that I've tried to avoid um, over the last several years. So that shows you how the updated fiscal stability plan looks, again, standing here on January 30th, um, how we would, how we would uh, fill that $850,000 gap uh, that we're projecting uh, using the fiscal stability plan. That's what it was designed to do. That was what was, you know, that's sort of how we laid it out. We've obviously tried to push that, that red out further. Um, uh, but that's where we are right now. You see all the factors. You see the increases that we're facing. You see the fact that we're getting a less than 1% increase in state aid. Um, you see all the other pressures um, and the uncertainty around health insurance, especially. Uh, so that's where we are um, in terms of that. So uh, the timeline going forward from here, obviously the next steps will be uh, the joint meeting of the city council and school committee is tonight. Um, Next step along the way, uh, we didn't really talk a whole lot about it, uh, enterprise funds tonight because I really wanted to focus on the general fund budget. Um, I'll be submitting uh, rates uh, for FY 2019 to the city council in March. That's more related to the enterprise fund budgets. Um, April 17th, 2018 is the deadline for NPS and, and uh, uh, Smith Vocational to adopt their budgets and submit them to the mayor. Um, in late April 2018, I'll be um, renewing my, my practice of, of going out to the community and holding a series of town hall meetings to discuss these um, issues directly with uh, residents and ask for their input. Um, May 31st is a deadline for the five-year capital improvement program, which is, uh, which is a separate uh, item that's on a separate track. And then June 30th, uh, 2018 is the deadline for city council to hold a public hearing and vote on the proposed FY 2018 budget. So that's the timeline. Um, I've tried to give you an overview of you know, where we've come, what the revenues uh, projected are, what our projected expenditures are, um, how it fits into the uh, fiscal stability uh, plan. Um, and at this point, I would just open it up to questions or comments. Or a moment of silence. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Councillor Bidwell and then Councillor Dwight. Well, I'll give you one. Um, with, with no projections for uh, marijuana revenue, if, say, we get to August, September, and it is pretty clear how many licensed facilities we have, we have a, some really rough indication mm -hmm. that, that might show a million dollars of additional revenue. Mm -hmm. what, what's, what would be the process at that point for... Uh, considering that and building that back into a budget? You know, I think one of the things I would obviously would look at is that if that were to happen, um, you know, we would, we would obviously look at that revenue, you know, once we get into the budget year like that and we have this new revenue that's come in, um, we'd still have a chance when we set the tax rate, theoretically, um, because when we, we, we set the tax rate later in the year, right. we're able to make adjustments there. That's closer to like November, December time frame, October, November time frame. So theoretically, if we saw a new revenue source, we could put, build that into the budget, which would mean, 
you know, can, that, that you could then theoretically say, okay, we're not going to draw from the fiscal stability fund. So that's one option. Again, the goal is not, is, you know, we, it's there. It was, it was built and put in place to be able to help support the budget. Um, but obviously, you know, we talked about the, um, we talked about our bond rating. We talked about, you know, not wanting to spend down reserves, not wanting to rely on reserves. So that would be one potential. If there was new revenue that came in um, that we couldn't anticipate prior to July 1st, that's the process uh, for which we'd be able to incorporate it into the budget. Again, whether we'll know anything by then, I don't know. It's a good question. Uh, you know, we'll have, we'll have things like host agreements, potentially two, which is allowed under the, um, under the regulations, They're actually required to have host agreements. Those can be up to 3% of revenue. I anticipate I'll be asking for 3% of revenue. Um, but whether or not they've generated revenue, uh, whether or not, you know, how much, you know, revenue we can actually book at that by October, I don't know what that will be. Um, so it's, it's a bit of an unknown. Um, uh, you know, it's really too early to tell. The regulations haven't even been finalized yet. We're just in the process of um, submitting our zoning and getting that moving forward in the process. Um, obviously, area communities are, will be, um, will, are also looking at this, Amherst, East Hampton, et cetera. So we'll have to see what it, what it, what it produces. Councilor Dwight. Uh, you know, that's actually very much in the, that was, the frame of my question more or less as well, and you answered pretty <coughs> much what I actually more or less anticipated you would say, because okay. there, there really isn't any way to, to have any sense of what this would mean as far as budgeting, and it would, uh, it, other than hold out a, a, a gossamer thin hope that there may be some offset. You also have to keep in mind that it, with the exception, not to turn this into, you know, a marijuana forum, but with the exception of the medical marijuana dispensaries, um, which already have a production facility, et cetera, right. you know, all the startup. The, everyone else can't put a seed in the ground until July 1st. Right. So, so that so would set the starting point much later. In terms we have of one of the few approved medical marijuana dispensaries that will on uh, July 1st be allowed to. If in fact they apply on April 1st right. and get approved. And I have a sneaky on. suspicion they might be, at, it's be doing that, but yeah. Exactly. But that's only one source. That's one. That is and, true. And as, as such, we won't be able to anticipate what the, what the trend would be, how much to anticipate for uh, expanded revenues. So. Exactly. It's a brand new industry. It's, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm not really sure what we could anticipate. But it, I just, I felt like I needed to call it out because it was. No, it, 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 it was things. hanging out there. For exactly. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Council President. Um, but I suppose you could, one of the advantages of building up the reserves as you've done is even if you have no idea what revenues might come from this new industry, you could always take the revenues in future years and replenish. Exactly. You know, you have that flexibility built exactly. into it. So even if you don't know by the summer what they'll be, yep. that's an, an advantage. Um, so that's a comment, I guess. And switching gears, one, one kind of minute question is the, the increase in the school budget that is non- um, Personnel, non-health care related. Yeah. Um, can you describe what accounts for that? Was it three percent or something? When you're saying, um, I guess I mean non. One percent slide. I thought I saw a slide that said uh, 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 general school system spending that was non-health care related yeah. up three percent. I'm wondering what constitutes the three percent. Yeah, that, that was that was strictly a full appropriation to the school department. Um, I was just, the, I mean, the way we account for health insurance in our budget is it's paid out of one line item on the city side of the budget. Um, so it's not we don't appropriate um, five million dollars to the schools to pay their pretty much half of the ten million dollar. Um, we pay for it indirectly. Right. So it shows up on our total expenditures for schools. I just wanted to show it because it's one of those big numbers that has fluctuated. And one of the things I've been committed to is maintaining that steady increase and not holding and, and, and basically not saying, you know, okay, Dr. Provost, we're going up, you know, $565,000. You know, of your 3%, I'm taking 250 of that to cover health care costs. Yes. Yeah. So that, no, that's no. why I was showing it. Yeah. No, thank you. No, that's 
Um, I, I got that. I'm wondering, so that, that adds into the, the, the percentage figure that accounts for the total increase in expenditures for the school. Is, is, is part of that is health care because you're not it's, I understand it's indirect, but the, yes. the figure of whatever it was, yes, 3%. Not the 3% number. Okay. Not the 3%. So the 3% number, that in, those increases in expenditures, what constitutes those? Just kind of natural increases? Well, about 75% of it is personnel costs. Um, you could Contractual pay raises. Contractual pay raises. You could okay. Materials and supplies, transportation. Yeah. So in, yeah, but if you look at their pie chart, you know, 75% of it is, is personnel costs, and then the rest is distributed to transportation and spend and other things like that. So no new personnel or stuff, just kind of natural um, anticipated increases in paying for what we, what we already have in the schools. We haven't brought forward our budget yet. Right. That 3% is more or less a target. Um, so okay. in every budget that I've presented, there's been a combination of restructuring and reductions in positions and additions of other positions. So that um, exact number isn't done yet. We'll have our sort of first look at that when I present the first view budget at the second school committee in February, and then that will get locked down hopefully at the second school committee in March. Okay. So I wasn't trying to get a sneak sure. preview from you. It's just curious. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Councilor Klein, Councilor Nash. Um, I was interested in the new property tax, the projected revenue, um, which is almost about two million dollars, and I would imagine that comes from mainly Village Hill, um, Leeds, Beaverbrook. So, so seven hundred and fifty thousand of that is the new growth. Uh, you know of that of that uh, what we're estimating and yeah so new growth would be things we're looking at like uh, Village Hill you know the, the final 35 acre um, project just had its permit approved the other night um, there's continues to be really steady uh, residential uh, growth happening throughout the city um, we've also got you know projects on King Street we just had a major uh, purchase of, of um, of a site on King Street by Colvest Development. Um, we anticipate over the next year we'll see activity there. Um, and then there's other properties, uh, again, that are going on to the tax rolls. You know, uh, so that's, it's always kind of the, uh, the natural, uh, you know, economic development activity, which fortunately has been very robust in Northampton. Um, you know, we didn't want to. We're not going to push it up as high as you know eight or nine hundred thousand. We're trying to still be responsible, um, but based on four to five year averages, that's why we're using seven fifty as a growth number. Obviously, if it comes in at a million, um, that's great. Um, if it comes in less, that that's 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 where we get into to difficulties at the end of the year when we're looking at you know at chewing up the budget. So, so the rest of it is basically the. Um, you know the two and a half percent that we're allowed to go up each year under prop two and a half um, so that's what represents uh, that portion of it so it's a combination of <coughs> the new growth plus the two and a half percent so the other the other piece of the question though that I had is um, at some point it seems like it, it, if it doesn't bottom out completely the new growth has to kind of slow down at some point. This isn't a kind of finite, an infinite resource. And so I'm curious how that, in projections for future years, how um, you're thinking about that. And then the other piece that I bring up every year and I just want to check in about again is um, revenue and savings from green infrastructure. And when I talk about green infrastructure, I'm not talking about um, mar retail marijuana. Yeah. <laughs> um, just, you know, what kind of role that can play as we do projections into the future, because I think that is, um, you know, that's a resource that we really have to be plumbing and thinking about for the future and um, could be a really good resource for revenue. No doubt about it, and you know, in, in the past several years, budgets we've we've within individual departments, primarily uh, through central services, but we've done a number of energy saving projects throughout the city, which then translate into reduced utility rates um, for both city and schools. LED street lights, you know, being one of the big ones. We've now moved to doing a whole bunch of LED lights in the schools. 
um, which we're working on as well as a follow-on to the residential uh, street lights. Obviously, the solar project, um, uh, the Amoresco landfill project. Um, again, we've assigned uh, over half of our uh, municipal buildings uh, to the savings from that. Um, we've got other solar projects, and we've got solar projects in the capital program. So that's definitely um, one of the reasons, you know, that we, we, we work on energy efficiency. Obviously, the other issues <coughs> around you know, climate change and global warming and, and wanting to make sure that we're, we're reducing our reliance on uh, fossil fuels are important, but there's also a, a pocketbook part of it as well. Um, so, yeah, to the extent that we continue to focus on those projects, it's going to reduce our operating costs and keep revenues local, hopefully. So I just want to make um, a request for the future that I've made in the past, okay. but I'd really love to see um, that built in a little bit to the slides so that we have an understanding of um, the ways in which green infrastructure really does save the city money and can be a source of revenue. So if there's a way to um, create that, I would really love okay. to see it and also I just wanted to say thank you because I think I every year I find this incredibly helpful it's really thorough and um, it's just a great presentation to kick off the year so thank you thank you counselor um, counselor Nash and then he had his hand up and then yeah, yeah. thank you mayor um, you mentioned that we expect a spike in the, the debt service and um, and that's just for this year is that going to go down at some it's point soon nice. or it's going to start going down. Yeah, it's going to start gradually moving down. So it'll be a gradual and rather than will. something's coming off the books or? Yes, no. And again, this is general. <coughs> so we do have some debt excluded projects that will be slowly coming off the books. We had, you know, JFK a couple of years ago um, in uh, basically in 2019 uh, and then I think 2020, we'll have the fire station and the high school coming off. But that really doesn't help us on the general <coughs> fund. That's debt excluded debt. That's above and beyond, uh, you know, that's outside of the, the, of the two and a half percent limit. So as that goes away, it's good because it will lower folks' taxes because, you know, it's those debt exclusion projects are going away, um, but it doesn't really affect that calculation. So uh, again, we've had, we, we occasionally have these issues. Um, it happened a few years ago. I forgot what it was. We were paying off one project and there was a there was sort of a, a spike because of the way we had funded it in the first year so it's one of those blips with the debt service um, but it's but it's not insignificant um, but again we could not have built the police station um, uh, without using this type of a funding model uh, in order to make it happen so that was the challenge we'd already put off the police station uh, two years when the economy tanked in 20, 2009 um, the voters obviously had given us $10 million uh, in debt excluded uh, funds, so we were trying to work in that additional 6 to $7 million into the debt program. So, Councilor. In, uh, I'm getting two bites of the apple, and I'm sorry, but the, on, on the growth and the growth discussion, how much of it is a zero sum gain when we are expanding uh, residential units, which also usually include services and in particular in many cases children who go into the schools that, that I mean there's a cost borne by that is is it offset by the increase in uh, in potential revenue or is, is you know I think the um, you know, obviously you know commercial side is preferable for a lot of reasons because it reduces right. you know, the share that's being paid by residential you know we haven't seen a, and part of it's because of our land use uh, planning and the way we've the way we've worked on zoning very very uh, strategically because we've tried to uh, focus on preserving uh, land from development in the outer edges of the city where there isn't infrastructure and there's more transportation costs. We focused on projects like Village Hill, uh, where you know it's walkable, it's closer uh, to our downtown. We haven't actually seen. Uh, you know, back you you recall back when Village Hill or the State Hospital was being proposed, there was a lot of concerns right. about what the impacts would be in terms of traffic and would we have to build a new school? You know, would we have to build a new fire station? Um, the projections really haven't borne out uh, those uh, those folks and students. And interestingly enough, you know, they've tended to use own more less cars uh, than than the rest of the population. Um, 
uh, there are there are plenty of school children there, but it hasn't created like a, an incredible burden uh, that we've had to try to mitigate. And then obviously transportation costs are, are, are minimal. We've already got services. We've already got utilities there. Um, it's it's you know close to downtown where we have fire uh, services. We've got police services. So I think it shows that one aspect of the way we've done our planning um, is also paying off in terms of sustain fiscal sustainability. Um, in terms of impacts and needs for, for utilities and services. Um, Wayne can obviously give you a, a much longer PowerPoint As, on that. Yes. Um, he's done a much longer analysis. But, um, uh, but again, I know that's something that people talk about, uh, but I think we've been very strategic about development. Um, and oftentimes you'll see us bring forward major uh, you know, land preservation acquisitions where we'll build in a couple of developments, often sometimes affordable developments, to help offset the costs and to make sure that we're not taking uh, developable land and potential housing stock uh, out of circulation. So we've been trying to be very careful about that. School committee member Fallon. Are you guys all done? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I guess my, um, well, thank you for making this so clear and, and accessible to everyone. Um, my question is, it's kind of two part, is I'm assuming that when our school side is um, Presented next month, that there are going to be a lot of parents and students over to advocating for a bigger budget and more money. But what stands out during your presentation is what's the problem is the lack of state aid. And so I know they want to advocate. What would you say would make the biggest impact on our budget? Are they writing letters to the governor, to the House, to the Senate, and are they asking for something specific like increased Chapter 70 funding or the charter school reimbursement or all of it? Yes. Like, I feel like they want to have very specific things that they're asking for. Yes. No, I, I definitely think, uh, you know, advocating with House, House and Senate uh, le you know, legislators basically, because then now the governor has presented his budget, now it really goes to the House and Senate. You know, unfortunately, um, uh, the speaker has d decreed that there shall be no new revenues, which is sort of how their revenue process works. Um, uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, he has basically said there will be no new revenues. He doesn't see any new revenues being raised in the House budget. Um, so basically it's about allocating you know, what <coughs> resources they have. So definitely, I mean, the governor has had a history of starting you know, Chapter 70 at the minimum $20 per student. Um, and then oftentimes the House will raise that slightly. Sometimes the Senate will go higher, and then they'll end up somewhere in the middle. Last year, that actually didn't happen. Um, you know, it didn't, it didn't happen last year. They basically, because of some of the revenue shortfalls they were seeing in the prior fiscal year, uh, the governor's very minimal increase stood. Um, so, uh, and then obviously charter school reimbursement. Uh, again, I showed you the statistic. Uh, they've continued to level fund it. It's underfunded. Uh, you know, we're, and at the same time that our tuition is going up. Um, and so that's just continuing to create a crunch, particularly for a district like Northampton, which has such a large uh, charter school population, you know, being surrounded by f five to six schools. Um, Circuit Breaker, they have added more money to Circuit Breaker, although, um, what I'm t MMA is projecting that it's still effectively underfunded because the costs of special ed services are also going up. Um, so, um, so those are the big ones for us. Um, you know, the other thing we haven't talked about, but it won't really help us for the 2019 budget, is obviously the fair share amendment um, is going to be critical. Again, it's a, a dedicated new revenue source, a tax on income over a million dollars that would be dedicated to education and transportation. The other thing I would strongly urge people to advocate against would be the proposed ballot question uh, lowering the um, sales tax um, to 5%, um, which again is going to have a, a significant impact on the state budget. Um, and will obviously affect these numbers um, if that passes. So, um, so those are the kinds of things that people should be focused on. Um, and you know, they're going to have a lot of company because this is a similar theme across a, a lot of different agencies, um, a lot of different line items. Um, you know, I'm the chair of the PBTA advisory board. Um, just like last year, we're being level funded. We had to make cuts last year. We're going to have to make cuts again. Uh, because we're, you know, it's pretty basic 
equation, you have fixed costs that go up gradually <coughs> every year, and if you get level funded enough years, you're going to have to make cuts. Um, and so uh, the governor's budget level funded, you know, regional transportation again. Um, and I know human service agencies, I know the universities, I know across the board, um, it's, it's going to be a similar situation. So, so definitely getting people to advocate and also getting people to understand, you know, that's one of the reasons why you know, I, I try to do this presentation and why I want to go out and do, eventually do town hall meetings, just again, so people can understand. Joe, your number seven. is 64, so. 64. Okay. Uh, play that number. Uh, yes, Lonnie Thank Kaufman. You. Mr. Kaufman. Um, just a couple of quick questions about state aid. Did the governor's budget include any um, support for communities like Northampton that uh, welcomed families from Puerto Rico? He um, he he did. Uh, he included a fifteen million dollar line item. I was actually talking about this a little bit with Dr. Provost. They've also announced a, a mid-year bill. Uh, that uh, apparently they're about to propose a mid-year uh, mm -hmm. spending bill to try to do to try to account for what happened in FY18 already. Yeah. Um, and so, but it's a little unclear what they're going to do with the 2019 monies. They are instructing school districts like Northampton to begin coding uh, their students who are here uh, displaced uh, by the storm by from Puerto Rico. <laughs> um, Presumably because there'll be some kind of a Chapter 70-like allocation of those funds. Right. So that's a possible new revenue source? It's a possible new revenue source, but, you know, $15 million spread across, right. I don't know how many school districts. Um, and again, it's to cover new students that have arrived sure. that are part of the, you know, that weren't part of the original Chapter 70 calculation. Right. Um, so it, it, it's potential new revenue. Okay. And then also, um, can you give a quick update on the gambling revenue? Like, as far as I know, there's at least one casino where maybe it's just a slot parlor that's open. And I, I just passed by Everett the other day. If the Wynn Casino actually opens, it's, it looks like it's getting close. Would that just be absorbed into this pathetic state aid, or would that be uh, disseminated through other means that might benefit the city? You know, there's, you know, it's set up to be able to support certain, you know, obviously there's host agreements that they have to pay to communities like Springfield, et cetera. Um, there is supposed to be additional revenue going to the state uh, budget. I didn't actually pay attention to how much revenue the governor was using as part of the budget from. Uh, so far, we only have the slot parlor yeah. uh, that's opened, um, which, you know, Depending on when you look at it, it's been you know behind projections, above projections. I don't know where it is in terms of the revenue. Um, you know, our casinos, the the Western Mass Casino, is not going to open until September, October, um, and then the Wynn Casino, if it's still called Wynn, uh, uh, much longer. Um, the No Name Casino, maybe uh, uh, that one again. I don't know what the timetable for that is. So. Anything that we would see uh, for this amazing new economic development engine that our state has hitched its wagon to would presumably, hopefully, show up in our um, in our state aid numbers, et cetera. But I'm not obviously, you know, placing any bets. Sorry. But if, if our formula is so low, our percentage is so low, it would be would it be incorporated into that very low percentage that we're getting the minimal? Increase, it, or is really, it a different line item? It's, un, it, it's, it's hard to know. I mean, I do know that within the legislation that created it, yeah. there's certain amounts of revenue, for example, revenue that has to be dedicated to problem gambling, for example. And they've got a whole study underway at UMass because um, they know there's going to be an increase in problem gambling. And they've got a, you know, so there's going to be some potential mitigation monies that are available to help support those impacts. Um, so, uh, but again, the idea was it would be additional state revenue based on the taxes that are collected right. um, and their percentage of the revenues under the licensure, um, which, but nothing specific in terms of how that translates into direct local aid okay. or, or Chapter 78. Thank you. Yep. Professor Voss. I have a question about the 16.5% increase in tuition to the charter school, and I just want to make sure I understand that. Is that the state saying each kid has a 16.5% increase, or is it Northampton's cost is going up 16.5% because we have more 
students going to charter schools? And after yeah. you answer that, I might have another okay. question. Yes. Uh, that's the best answer I can give you. So one of the, there's sort of multiple things that are happening. And these, every time they do a, they do a snapshot, you know, of these cherry sheets when the House introduced the budget, these numbers are probably going to fluctuate. They're basically looking at right now how many charter school students they're projecting from Northampton, mostly based on who's currently in the system right now. Um, then they're using um, tuition estimates. And again, the tuitions are different at every uh, school, and those tuitions will be updated as they move through the process. Um, so they're trying to basically take those numbers right now and extrapolate an estimate of what that's going to be. Clearly, so I, I, I haven't drilled down far enough to know whether it's, there, it's more students. Um, obviously, the tuition's gone up, so we know that there's an increase in tuition, but I don't know whether it's more students or a combination of the two. Uh, we'll have to try to unpack that once we see uh, firmer numbers on that. Um, so that's kind of, I know it doesn't really answer your question. Maybe Dr. Provost could add to that. So I would just um, explain that the numbers used in the cherry sheets are pure estimates. Um, in, in the past, the actual charges and actual numbers have turned out to vary from the cherry sheet estimate quite a bit, but it's, it's just the starting point for budgeting. Yeah, okay. it's, it's the only number we really have to work from at this point. Um, and then when is the, what's the enrollment deadline? I mean, when will you have a sense of that? Pretty much right up until. The, the two dates that are important will be October 1st of next year and December 1st of next year. Yeah, okay. So that's when we'll know for sure what the numbers were. Yes, which doesn't help us much <laughs> July 1st, but uh, right. yeah. Right, it's, the state's giving us a 0.68% increase for our school budget and mm -hmm. the charters somehow a 16.5 that's just an order that that doesn't work yeah and i think you'll find that's fairly um okay. fairly common across and that's therein lies the problem mm -hmm. um and it's it's all coming from the same pie of education funding um you know and, and the divide just continues to grow so um so that's why you know northampton like many communities have been advocating for reforms to that system the other thing i forgot to mention to you is the is the you know, there's, a, there's been some lip service paid to the, um, the found, Foundation Budget Review Committee, um, but there are advocates, uh, you know, in the House and the Senate, uh, you know, um, Senator uh, Sonia uh, Chang-Diaz, who's a major, she was on the commission. She has, you know, she was fairly, used fairly sharp uh, words in responding to the governor's budget. Um, and said, really, we need to get serious about implementing that, uh, the, the recommendations of that committee, um, because really there's not, there's been a little tinkering related to that, little, slight little technical fixes, uh, but in terms of really addressing the issue of, you know, how we, how much we're, we're accounting for the true cost of education in the Chapter 70 program, that really hasn't been done. But of course, that would require new revenue. And of course, you know, we, um, the current administration does not want to create that kind of new revenue, or at least don't, doesn't have an appetite. Certainly not this year, uh, they don't have an appetite for that. So, um, which is why we've, you know, gone to, you know, we've had to have, you know, the ballot question to try to create new revenue. Um, and uh, and other other ways around that but that's another one that people should keep an eye on and i know she's going to probably be holding some hearings around that um so that'll be important uh, to look at as well on the senate side other questions other comments okay so again uh you know we we come together at this meeting just to kind of look at a snapshot and again i have to emphasize uh, you know, this is a snapshot today based on some of our preliminary numbers. Um, we're going to be continuing to uh, refine those numbers, obviously watching the various different uh, uh, sources that we, we, we highlighted, you know, health insurance, working on individual departmental budgets, following what's happening in the House debate over their budget, um, and, uh, and, and trying to get the best information we can as we put together uh, the budget. Obviously, the school committee will begin their process much earlier. Uh, the two school committees will begin working on their budgets um, with the goal of making sure we have a balanced uh, budget um, in place by July 1st.
So with that, if there's not any more questions or comments, I would entertain a motion to adjourn this joint meeting. So moved. Second. Second. Okay, there's been a motion uh, made by uh, Councillor Dwight, seconded by Councillor Shera. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, any abstentions? The meeting is adjourned. <laughs>